Let's see what ADHD symptoms are. Being unable to sit still, especially in calm or quiet surroundings. Okay, so me and every other boy in middle school. Constantly fidgeting. Easy. Being unable to concentrate on tasks. Hmm. Excessive physical movement. Wow. Sounds like a young boy. The year is 2023. Everybody has ADHD. Our attention span, gone. Ability to focus, gone. Ability to sit still, never had it in the first place. Video games, oh. Social media, oh. Big booties, oh. Dopamine is the new substance. I can't use the other word because YouTube will demonetize me. But guys, seriously, we have totally screwed ourselves, both our own decisions, our parents' decisions, society's decisions to just encourage us to just consume, consume, consume. Now we have no attention span. We have no focus, no discipline, no impulse control. You go on Google, what's wrong with me? Oh, looks like I have ADHD. Just about everybody knows somebody that has the condition known as attention deficit hyperactive disorder or just attention deficit disorder. There's a couple variations here. I'm not a doctor, guys, but I am a PhD. Pretty huge d In this video, I'm going to be telling you guys why I think most young men have ADHD. Now, I'm not a doctor, like I said before, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. I myself have been diagnosed with ADHD. Family members of mine have been diagnosed with ADHD. I have a feeling I know why I in particular have ADHD, and I will reveal that at the end of the video. But for now, let's talk about all of the information that we've been consuming in the recent years from legitimate sources, guys like Jordan Peterson, Andrew Huberman, etc., where they have discussed ADHD. So some of the takeaways I have is that men are not able to sit still in classrooms as easily as women. We do not learn the same way that women do. We're much more hands-on. We also are very competitive. We're very hyperactive. We have different chemicals in our bodies, especially as we get older, that essentially make us want to run around. We are much more physically dominant. We are less social. We're more independent but we just have all this energy that we need to get out of our bodies. So naturally, you take a young boy, you sit him in a chair, and he's going to start fidgeting. He's going to start creating problems that aren't there, like throwing balls at somebody else in the class, doodling on a piece of paper. That was me. I was a doodler. Denmo the doodler. That's a funny word, eh? Doodler. That was my experience as a child. Me and boys would just constantly be causing problems. I was very problematic in class. I got in trouble with teachers all the time. I was starting fights with people. I was saying bad things to other people. I was disagreeing with my teacher. But here's the kicker, guys. I was actually a really good student. I would put way less effort in than anybody else, and I would just magically get good marks. It was actually kind of awesome. However, there were certain subjects I just didn't care about, no matter what. You could put a gun to my head, and I probably would not perform as well on this particular subject. I just wasn't the best at like engineering, physics. I just didn't care. I just didn't want to do it. But that's besides the point. What I'm getting at is that young boys are just meant to run around. We are physical creatures. We need to do stuff. We can't sit still all day. But again, most teachers, they're women. So naturally, unless they have young boys, they don't understand that. So you're going to be in a world that's dominated by female teachers that don't necessarily know the differences between young boys and young girls. Or at the very least, they don't act or treat them differently because the education system is meant for people to just sit still and listen and nod their head. And that's just not a thing that young boys do naturally, which is why so many young men, disproportionately young men, are the ones diagnosed with all these issues, including issues on the spectrum, such as autism, the tisms, good old tisms, and ADHD. We also know that most women go to university and they complete their degrees much more often than men do. And they actually have better grades, better marks, and better offers in university. Now, that's the majority. That's like the middle class. The highest functioning people, intelligence-wise, are usually still men. But on the other end of the spectrum, the dumbest people in the world are also men. Women, for the most part, are more intelligent than men, and they make up the middle of the area. So that's one of the takeaways that I've heard. The next thing I've heard is that over the last 50, 30, 20 years, ADHD and all conditions have exploded over the last 50, 30, 20 years. Now, let's just get this one out of the way. I don't believe it's because a lot of people ran around undiagnosed. I mean, sure, that could be it. But I truly believe that most men have ADHD and are meant to have ADHD. And it's not necessarily something that we need to label because that's just how men are. The reason it's especially becoming like this as we get into the 2010s, 2020s, and so on is because of social media, smartphones, online videos, online information, video games, TV. I mean, we are stimulated 24-7. And there's a direct correlation between using social media 
and having access to unlimited information on this beautiful light up screen with all these bright colors and not wanting to do anything else. That's what computers are. That's what phones are. That's what video games are. They are just blasting our pleasure systems, right? And then a teacher will be like, yo, dude, okay, read this book now. Read this play from the 1800s. And you're going to be like, no, I want to go on my phone. Nobody wants to do that anymore. Our parents, they used to have to go to a library to learn something. They couldn't just go on their phone and Google it. They had to go to a library. They had to call somebody. They had to research an expert or they had to know a guy that did everything. All of you guys that have dads here, when we were growing up, our dad was always like, yep, I know a guy. Oh yeah, I got a guy for that. I got a guy for that. And we don't have any guys anymore. We just have the computer. We have the phone. So it's way easy for us to just open the rabbit hole and just consume, consume, consume. Now, especially as young men in society, and not just young men, but young women as well, our entire culture is now cooked into using social media on a regular basis. So I didn't get a phone until I was, I don't know, 16 or 17. I used to leave my house, knock on my buddy's doors. I didn't consume that much to the same extent as others do, especially this generation. But everybody is connected now on social media. Everybody's using Instagram, Snapchat, group chats. School doesn't end now. You just go on your phone and then the next six hours of your day up until you get out of high school is just stuff with your friends. Oh, who said this? Who said that? What are we doing tomorrow? Okay, what's on the test? Weekends, you're hanging out with these people, but you're just exchanging information. And even the guys that are introverted now, what do they do? They want to feel a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose. They need more dopamine in their lives. So what do they do? They don't talk to their friends from high school or middle school. Maybe they get bullied. Maybe they just choose not to. And they go on the computer. They play video games. They go on Reddit. They join all these online communities. And now they feel fulfilled like they're around other people because they see all those little heads and they're like, oh, I guess I'm in a room with 50 people now. But it's the exact same thing. We are just so addicted because it's so good. It just feels so good. We can't help it, right? And then you try to do something that takes a long period of time. Lots of work, lots of focus. Oh, well, he's distracted. He doesn't want to do his work. He isn't doing that good. His grades are bad. Well, what do you think it is? Hmm, I wonder. Maybe it's ADHD. Okay, so what are the characteristics of somebody with ADHD? Let's just Google that. Just for shit, guys. Okay, this is hilarious. I have all these, and I had all these when I was in school. And I actually allegedly did a presentation explaining how easy it is to get prescriptions here in the beautiful country of Canada. Let's see what ADHD symptoms are. Being unable to sit still, especially in calm or quiet surroundings. Okay, so me and every other boy in middle school, constantly fidgeting. Yeah, okay, easy. Being unable to concentrate on tasks. Hmm. Okay, guys, imagine that. Imagine doing hours of homework after playing two hours of video games. You think that's going to happen? Excessive physical movement. Wow. Sounds like a young boy. Excessive talking. Hmm. Okay, maybe that's just me. I just love yapping, don't I? Being unable to wait their turn. Oh, yeah, that's dudes to a T. I would even argue that's a lot of that's just competitiveness. For whatever reason, we just prioritize being first in line. The person who gets the biggest pizza, pizza. I mean, that's cooked into our DNA. Acting without thinking. Wow. Okay, that's every guy ever. Interrupting conversations. Okay, that's ADHD. Okay, that one surprised me a little bit. But guys, literally, I'm eight of these 10. And most of the people I grew up with are at least seven or eight of these 10. This is wild. This is like every single human being. And that's all you need to get a prescription. Okay? Okay, another definition. Inattention, impulsivity, and in some cases, hyperactivity. Okay, more or less the same thing. Are you guys watching right now? I'm not a doctor, okay? So don't take my word for it. But does that not describe most of you? Does that not describe like at least 80% of the symptoms that you have experienced in your life? Of course it does. It's a pretty low-hanging fruit, don't you think? So moving on, the reason I think so many young men in particular have this is because the main difference between us and the previous generation is we have access to all these things that stimulate our dopamine that they did not. Back in the day, you had to work for your dopamine. If you wanted to bang a chick, you had to improve your life, make money, get a job, go and meet women in real life, or make friends and then meet them through social circles. And then you could meet a girl and then you could pump. And the extreme of that back then, the dopamine back then was, okay, well, you can get a magazine. So now you got to go to the store, you got to save up money, you got to be super shady, buy a Playboy magazine, go out to the forest and just oh, furiously beat off. Hide it in your basement or your dad's attic or buy a calendar that hangs on the wall. I mean, guys, most of our parents' generation, they had to close their eyes and imagine when they beat off. Oh, right now it's everywhere. That was something that we didn't have. 
And that's man's number one mission is to reproduce and spread seed. So our entire reward system for getting dopamine in the real world has been hijacked. So that's the number one problem. The next ones are just instant validation, gratification. Instead of having to go on some kind of journey or mission, like, I don't know, going to a library, researching something, reading something, we just Google the summary right away. We have access at our fingertips. And in theory, this is a beautiful thing because it gives us time to do other stuff. But I don't see anybody out here that is like, well, since I figured this thing out in five minutes, now I can go play sports for three hours. Now I can go hang out with friends in real life. Now I can learn this skill or read a book. No, they just figure that thing out in five minutes and then they go right back to the computer, right back to the dopamine source. It's right back to where they were before. In theory, social media and the internet is amazing. But what we don't have is impulse control because at the end of the day, guys, we're apes, okay? Gorilla mode 2023. Here we go. Okay, so let's talk about me a little bit when I was a kid. So I come from a relatively, let's say, artistic family. My grandfather, he was an absolute pioneer. His father passed away when he was young, so he had to take over the farm when he was very young. I think he was like 15. His dad passed away of diabetes, and he worked on the farm so that his siblings could go to school, finish high school. You know, my grandpa didn't finish high school. He dropped out when he was like 15 or 16. So the tale goes and worked so that they could go to school. And that made him a hard ass dude. It made him just a workaholic. He was very hard on me and mostly hard on me because I'm the oldest of all my cousins and siblings. So he still had a lot of piss and vinegar in his system as I was growing up, but he was obviously nicer to them because they were just like kids, you know, in his final years, but I was the oldest. So he was hard on me and I'm named after him. I'm uh, technically Jack the second. So he wanted me to be Superman pretty much. And he was very hard on me. My dad was hard on me too, but my dad was much more chill than my grandpa was because again, it's a different generational thing, right? Anyways, later in life, my grandfather, he really got into arts. He became very creative. He loved painting. He loved building stuff. He'd build walking sticks or like canoes, birdhouses, that kind of thing. So he had that creativity to him, but it was something he never was able to use to make a living with. He worked at a car dealership. That was it. He sold cars. He knew everybody in his town and the neighboring towns and the city because everybody needed a car. And my grandpa was just a clutch salesman. So again, he was good at making people laugh. And you know, all the things that I feel like I inherited from him, very good social skills and balls, but also just being eccentric and neurotic to an extent. So that got passed down to my mother's side of the family. So my dad's side of the family, they were just hard ass, hardworking immigrants. They just went hard, worked in factories. You know, my dad did some sales and stuff, but he admits he never had the same creativity that my mom's side of the family had. And then uh, my mom and all our aunts, they were very artistic. They all went to university. They got degrees, mostly became teachers. And teachers, they're good at yapping to people. So again, guys, here I am teaching to you guys, as opposed to being in a classroom. That would suck. <laughs> for me, anyways, it was good for them. And then as a kid, I was encouraged to pursue art. I drew like crazy. I would buy like Pokemon cards, Digimon cards, whatever. And I didn't even know how to play the game. I would just draw them. I would sketch them. I would make cartoons. I'd have my own characters. I would make comic books. And then eventually I discovered animation. So I started making animations and then high school hit. And when high school hit, I went through a really tough phase where I realized that in order for me to not go down this weirdo rabbit hole in high school, I had to kind of like learn how to not obsess over drawing and making art because that wasn't cool in high school. Nobody was really supportive of that. So I had to know how to like talk to other people, break balls, be interested in other things like say sports or hanging out or going to parties and stuff. When in reality, I was just always obsessed with creative stuff. So that made me stop that for a long time. And then as an adult, I got back into it, which is a great thing. But I believe the reason that I was able to have that passion. And to this day, I have the passion of making movies in Hollywood, like acting, script writing, comedy stuff. It's because that is what I was exposed to when I was young and my brain was still developing. All that gray matter just put in so many hours as a kid creating stuff that I'm really good at it and I love doing it. And when you love doing something, you get good at it. And when you get good at something, you love doing it. So that's why I am the way I am. But at the same time, guys, there's a sense of ADHD to that because I was always left to my own devices. I was always able to socialize with people enough that I could get them to do stuff for me. I was really good at talking to teachers who would give me animation programs from the school of computers. 
I had access to all kinds of encouragement from my parents and my grandfather about getting creative and doing stuff like that. And he was still hard on me, but I essentially from a young age had access to a computer. So I spent hours and hours online and it wasn't just doing art stuff. A lot of it was just doing stupid stuff on the computer. But again, you got to think guys, as a kid, all this exposure to computers, I mean, it just blew my dopamine receptors, right? So now I become an adult and I have to sit down and I have to work really hard on stuff. And it caught me off guard. I'm like, oh, this is stupid. Like, wh why am I reading these books? Why am I going to school for this when I could just work for myself? And maybe I inherited some, what of a good IQ or a little bit more craziness than the average person, but I figured it out. But I don't think most people figure that out. I think most people, they get stuck in that dopamine loop. And it's mostly because the amount of hours and time they put in on social media, phones, and internet and video games when their brain is still developing. And the reason I bring this up as such an important point is that if I was born, let's say, instead of in the 90s, if I was born in the 2000s, I feel like I'd be a mess right now because I don't think that my young, immature brain would be able to tolerate smartphones, social media, and internet access. I am terrified about kids that are getting phones and social media accounts when they're like 10 to 15 years old. Of course, they're going to have ADHD. Why would you want to do anything when your brain just explodes with dopamine at such a young age? I fortunately didn't have the social media or smartphone thing till at least when I was 18 or 19. So that prevented me from going even deeper down the ADHD rabbit hole, in my opinion. And I will say this, I believe our parents didn't really know any better because they didn't even know what that was like, right? Like sometimes I'll go to a restaurant and I'm eating there. And I see parents with their kids and their kids are just on their phones and tablets the whole time. And I'm like, oh man, like I would never let my kid do that. I mean, I don't have kids yet, but I would assume that's very bad for them, but they don't know any better. They probably look at social media the same way an adult looks at a rat or a mouse. We're just like, oh, it's a rat or a mouse, you know, just kill it, whatever. It's, you know, it's not that much of a danger to us. But when you're a kid and you see a mouse, you're going to scream, you're going to run, you're going to get your parents to be like, oh my God, there's a mouse mouse in the house. I remember one time we had a bat stuck in our attic and we all freaked out and me and my dad got baseball bats and just destroyed it. I just clobbered it across my sister's room. That analogy wasn't the best guys, but the point I'm making is as an adult with a mature brain, you can be like, oh, that's not even that big a deal. So I think my theory is my parents and parents that are probably in the age range of like, I don't know, let's say 35 to 50, they miss the era. They just narrowly missed it, the era of internet access, social media, and video games and stuff. So they don't know how powerful it is to a young brain. They just go, oh, well, I didn't have that. I think it's cool. It's good. I guess everybody's doing that now. So as you were. Meanwhile, though, their brain, their gray matter, their attention span was preserved until they were at least 20, 25 years old. Like most parents that are in their 40s now, I imagine they didn't get phones till they were already graduated high school and college. They'd already consistently worked and gone without immediate gratification. They had matured fully and then they got phones. So it's like they were ready for it without even realizing it. But we're not ready because we're giving it to kids at such a young age. So because of that, I feel like our parents don't understand it, but also they don't understand how vulnerable we are and they don't necessarily get it. So that's why I believe so many older people, particularly like grandparents age, are so hard on young people because they never grew up with that. They don't get it. They're just like, I just used to work really hard. It wasn't about what I wanted to do, what I was passionate about doing. I just worked hard. And that's all they knew. And they were good at it because they didn't have any other choice. And then they matured as an adult without being exposed to all these dopamine activities. That's why our grandparents stayed together. That's why they don't have ADHD. Or if they did, they just learned to deal with it. And then they made our parents. And then here we are. And now they look at us and they're like, what is wrong with these kids? They don't want to work hard anymore. Well, of course we don't want to work on anymore because our brains have been malnourished by the positive side effects of delayed gratification, focusing and working without dopamine. And that is why I believe most men have ADHD. The next thing I'm going to get to is ease of prescription. So like I said, I live in Canada. It's relatively easy to get an ADHD prescription. All you have to do is go in, say, hey, I have this. They'll probably start you on some kind of small dosage. And then over time, you just keep telling them what they want to hear or rather what you actually feel, you know, disclaimer, just saying that. And then you slowly but surely try new things, higher dosage. Next thing you know, you're just used to taking that all the time. And here's the kicker. 
these people take all these and then they do the same thing. They go on their phone, they play video games. Now the problem is, I mean, there aren't necessarily long-term studies that clearly define this, but their base level requirement, attention span, requires a lot more dopamine or at the very least them to be on their medication. And when they go without it, that's very dangerous because now your body might not naturally produce it. So this is something that's going to definitely be researched and conclusive results may come out in the next 10 to 15 years. But what I'm saying is certain medications may be frying our brains without us even realizing it. The next thing is that the incentive of finishing appointments early by the doctors is what leads to less interest or attention being given to people that are having issues. For example, here in Canada, allegedly, doctors receive performance bonuses when they finish meetings and appointments quicker. So if they recommend a prescription to somebody, they can't get a kickback off that. They don't get a commission for every benzo they give somebody. However, they do get a performance bonus when they're able to manage more clients, more customers, more patients in a shorter amount of time. So if you can see 100 people versus 50 people, then you will make more money. And because of that, appointments are straight to the point. I don't know where you guys live, but a lot of the time doctors, they do phone appointments. now. So that way it saves you the time of going in, sitting in the lobby. And naturally, when you sit in front of somebody, it's much easier for you to open up emotionally, for you to take more of their time, for them to really listen to what you're saying. So it's harder for them to get you out of the office. But if they just call you, you don't have that face-to-face interaction. It's just over the phone. So you can kind of talk over each other. Okay, here's what we're going to do. You can remain very stoic and to the point and just tell the person that's calling, hey, okay, well, we're going to try this, right? Because of that, doctors are making mostly phone calls and somebody calls, they're like, hey, this is the problem I have. I think I have this, I have that. And they go, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you on this. We're going to put you on that. And then the appointment is like very structured. It's like a sales script, a framework, if you will. And it's usually over in like two to five minutes. I've even noticed this myself. When I call my doctor about like, hey, I want to get a blood test to get like my testosterone levels checked or something. The phone call's done within 60 seconds. Before, you'd have to make an appointment, drive over there, and talk to him for 10 to 15 minutes. Now it's like, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. Book, 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 done. So in that regard, it's good. But the problem is, I think a lot of the nuance of what people are truly needing to improve on, i.e. exercise, restraint, impulse control, healthy diets, parents that are putting more attention towards their children and not rewarding bad behaviors and looking for an easy fix, All of that is lost over the phone when a doctor just rapid fire prescribes you stuff. So that could be different whatever country you're in, but that's my perception of it in Canada. There's goods and there's bads and there's uglies, but that is one of the other causes as well. The last thing is that a lot of people are just in pain. They don't know what they want to do. They're confused. Their dopamine receptors are just pooched. And these prescriptions that they give out actually help some people because the way they work is they make effort feel good. That's the best way I could describe what it's like to be on some kind of stimulant. A minor example of this would be something like coffee. Now, some of you guys, you get anxiety from drinking coffee, but for those of you that don't, when you drink a coffee, you get way more energetic, dopamine gets released in your body, you're much more focused, alert, you're not as tired, and you're able to complete more work. So imagine if you had a coffee that lasted anywhere from six to eight hours, and then you took that every day, And you're like, you know what? This coffee's good, but what if it was like two shots of coffee? What if it was like a double espresso? That's kind of the idea with these. They're stimulants and they make you get more work done. So I'm curious for those of you watching right now that have gone on some kind of ADHD medication, drop a comment below and let us know the effects you had. Because some people, when they do go on it, they go, whoa, this is too much. This is intense for me. Others, they're like, oh my God, all of a sudden the sun has parted the clouds and I'm getting hit with sun rays, right? It just clicks. But is that because your family was predispositioned to something that technically we can't test for? You know, like a lot of prescriptions, we don't actually know how they work. So you can't really measure a lot of the things that go on in our brain. So that kind of science is very sketchy and iffy. And because of that, a lot of people think ADHD isn't even real. Now, I wouldn't go that far. But the point I'm making is, A lot of the things we're told as society aren't necessarily true. They're just the best answer that they have right now. And for most people, that's enough. So that is why I believe so many men have ADHD. So at this point in the video, let's discuss ways to improve your ADHD. The truth is, guys, this is going to be very challenging and hard, especially in the short term. But this will regain 
your attention span, your focus, and your impulse control. Number one thing you need to do, turn everything you have on black and white. Your phone on black and white, your computer on black and white, delete your social media apps. Don't worry. You're not going anywhere. You can always go back in the future. The world isn't going to burn down. You're not going to get bullied if you stop going on Instagram for a couple of days, all right? Put your phone on Do Not Disturb. That way you don't get notifications coming in to constantly take your attention. Don't play video games for a day. Don't watch TV for a day. Just sit by yourself in a room with the lights off or lights on. Read a book. I'm telling you guys, you're going to want to pull your eyeballs out. You are literally going to bite your fingernails off. You're going to be so bored. And that is when you realize, wow. I have a serious problem here. I can't even sit still and read a book for 30 minutes without checking my phone, going on social media, watching TV, or consuming some kind of content. That's most young men nowadays. And that's why videos like this are important because it calls out the thing that you deep down know, but would never necessarily hear somebody else tell you in order to encourage you to change your ways. So that's what I'm telling you right now. Next thing you need to do is exercise because when you exercise, your body releases chemicals in your body that make you more logical and make you make the right decisions. And if you make the right decisions, that means you don't make the wrong decisions as much, which means you have more control over wrong decisions, aka impulse control. Okay, you're driving back from the gym. Normally, if you didn't go to the gym, you'd probably be like, ooh, I want that McDonald's or that fast food. But after going to the gym, you're like, nope, I have my meal at home. I know what I should be eating. I know I should be eating the protein and vegetables, so I will not go there. You slowly but surely train yourself to make better decisions to the point where now you don't need to remind yourself by watching videos like this, it's much easier for you. And you get to a point where now your phone could be in color mode, it could have notifications on, but you still have the discipline to not check it. And if you can do that with slowly, and if you can do that one thing at a time with your phone, your computer, your social media apps, video games, TV, slowly but surely your base level of what you can focus on and get joy, pleasure, and dopamine from will slowly but surely go higher and higher. All of a sudden, you'll be like, yo, I went for a walk today and I felt good. I read a book today and I felt good. Instead, what you guys are doing is you're just spamming the dopamine button. You're just like, Ugh! all day. And because of that, you probably have ADHD. Wouldn't it be easier to just fix it the old fashioned way though, instead of relying on something? that you have to consume every day like a little pill just me guys i don't know let me know what you guys think below that's my theory again i'm gonna probably call this video why most young men have adhd i'm not a doctor i'm not an expert here i'm just winging it this is from my experience from podcasts i've consumed stories i've heard things i've read you know yada 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 so let me know what your guys thoughts are if you do want to talk to other people about what you're going through Get on a self-improvement journey, Monk Mode 2023. Join our Discord. Link is in the description below. Top pinned comments. I'll see you guys in there. And next video to watch after this is right there.